Hi everyone, Zoe here, and no, this isn't the democracy video, at least not yet. Um, it's still coming though, I swear. Instead, I'd like to talk a little bit about the deteriorating state of transgender rights in the United Kingdom. I know, right? Another super cheerful video, just what you wanted. Um, but before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the importance of everything that's going on in the States right now, as well as around the world in support. Um, Basically, I don't intend for this video to be a distraction from the Black Lives Matter uprisings. And um, I deliberately chose not to actually record any to camera videos for the first few weeks of the protests for that very reason. So um, hopefully it will become painfully obvious over the course of my next few videos that I'm 100% in solidarity with the protesters and that I don't believe for one minute that um, centuries of accumulated systemic racism in police forces can just be um, reformed. Uh, these institutions definitively need to be progressively defunded, dismantled, and replaced with, you know, transformative and restorative justice approaches that befit a civilized society, unlike the cops. So yeah, for anyone who hasn't like immediately downvoted this video and run for the door, um, I'm going to quickly situate the UK amongst other European countries when it comes to LGBT rights. Now, ILGA Europe is an organization that monitors national policies and each year releases a scoring of the best and worst places to live if you happen to be part of the 10% of the human race that is LGBT. Uh, and on its scale, 100% means full equality for LGBT folk, whereas 0% um, represents, you know, gross violations of human rights and widespread violent discrimination against queer communities. So, you know, quite the spread. Unsurprisingly, um, several of the worst ranking nations like Turkey, uh, Armenia, Poland, Russia, and Hungary, obviously, have all banned pride marches outright and similar events. Um, this is a pretty simple strategy and it's intended to force LGBT people into hiding and to erase us from public awareness, like that ever works. I mean, Poland is a very extreme example where I think at present over a hundred municipalities, which is to say like one third of the entire country, have declared themselves to be LGBT free zones. You know, apparently to encourage citizens to harass and stigmatize anyone who isn't heterosexual and cisgender. Romania uh, has gone further still, uh, just this Tuesday, in fact, having approved a bill which forbids any discussion of gender theory in schools or universities. So this is um, darkly reminiscent of the UK's notorious Section 28, which the Conservative Party passed back in 1988 in an overt attempt to basically erase LGBT people and history from the British education system. I mean, they framed it as um, banning the promotion of homosexuality, but it was a deeply pernicious uh, piece of legislation which remained in force for 15 years, during which time teachers could literally be arrested for daring to suggest that queer people were just a valid part of human society as straight people were. So um, we're seeing some of the same tired old rhetoric uh, being dusted off here in 2020 as the Tories again hope to play to their bigoted core, only this time turning them against trans people. But we'll come to that in a minute. Um, moving beyond like just outlawing LGBT inclusive school curricula, um, there's the tactic of banning legal recognition of transgender people entirely, as Hungary did just last month, and which Bulgaria has sought to do by removing all provisions for changing one's name or gender markers on official legal documents. Again, the goal here is to basically make it impossible for trans people to exist and to inspire hate groups to persecute them, you know, just in case the government's agenda wasn't clear. So, this approach um, has actually further metastasized in Russia, where they have a government that is openly anti-LGBT and which has been pursuing legislation to outlaw all public displays of same-sex affection and of variant gender identity. So note that this is the same exact government which tacitly greenlights the activities of terrorist groups like Occupy Pedophilia and Parents of Russia, which um, bait, lure, abduct, and torture LGBT people, typically gay men, um, on camera, and then they would later release these videos to um, their slavering fan bases. Sorry, I probably should put a um, content warning at the start of this video. But suffice it to say, I'm never gonna go back 
to Russia again. Um, I mean, I don't know why we should be surprised. Horrific vigilante mob actions like this are the inevitable consequence of painting LGBT people as potential sexual predators, despite all of the evidence to the contrary. In fact, what happens is that we become the prey of gleeful, merciless hate groups inspired by truly dreadful human beings um, who only ever seem to use their positions of privilege, power, wealth, and influence to demonize innocent and vulnerable communities. I really wish they'd get another hobby, I swear to God. Anyway, um, I could spend a whole series of videos exploring the sustained assault on LGBT plus rights that are um, currently underway worldwide, but my focus today, as I said, is on what's happening here in the UK. So briefly, um, the Conservative government under Boris Johnson is doing its level best to ensure that Britain becomes yet another dystopian hellhole for LGBT people, and they're starting as usual by targeting the transgender community because Tories have no imagination. So um, you'll remember ILGA Europe. Well, year on year, the UK has continued an alarming descent down the rainbow list. So it had a high water watermark back in um, 2015 of 86%, which isn't bad. I mean, it's no Malta, but it wasn't awful. But then it went down to 81% in 2016, to 76% in 2017, to 73% in 2018, and then down to 66% in 2019, just last year. So yeah, that's a breathtaking drop of 20 percentage points in four years. So when LGBT people tell you things are getting very, very scary for us in Britain, you should really take us seriously. Because this trend is only accelerating under our brutal Tory government. I mean, having bungled its response to COVID-19 so very badly that the UK um, briefly had the world's highest number of excess deaths per capita, it's now desperately trying to distract public attention from that mess by failing in yet another arena. I mean, it's basically what the Tories do. You see, um, at the start of this week, a story in the Sunday Times reported on a leaked paper which revealed the Tories not only would not pursue reforms to increase equality for transgender people in British society, but in point of fact, were planning an all-out assault on basic trans rights, yeah, including uh, denying appropriate health care to trans youth and banning trans adults from single-sex spaces matching our lived gender. So um, the word on the street was that Liz Truss, the, um, the Minister for Women and Equalities, would present these proposals during this Wednesday, Wednesday's session in Parliament. And yeah, if you think it's slightly Orwellian that the um, Minister for Women and Equalities is ardently pursuing legislation that will in fact endanger millions of women and vastly increase the amount of inequality across Britain, then congratulations, you're paying attention. I mean, to be, to be honest, everything about um, our current government is basically Orwellian. But um, yeah, for those of you who aren't as steeped in LGBT issues as most trans folk are, let me provide a bit of context. And yes, I promise it's going to be a really brief history lesson. Don't panic. Um, I guess let's start uh, back in 2004. The UK passed something called the Gender Recognition Act. And this created an arduous process by which trans people might achieve legal recognition of their gender identity. And the system, as it stands, is designed to make this as difficult and drawn out as possible, as befits, you know, the current gatekeeping mentality towards trans and non-binary folk in the UK. For instance, um, all applicants for a gender recognition certificate must first spend at least two years living openly as their declared gender, must assemble a broad spectrum of evidence and affidavits proving that they are trans, and then must submit to intrusive questioning by an anonymous panel that they never meet face to face of so-called experts, who knows, we don't know who they are, who may then decide without any required justification nor any real appeals process to just reject the application. It's been like this for 16 years now. So then, um, in 2010, another piece of legislation called the Equality Act came into force, and this offered some progress um, by adding gender identity 
to the list of um, so-called protected characteristics. So these are things like age, um, disability, religion, ethnicity, sex, sexual um, orientation. You know, things that employers and businesses cannot legally use as the basis for discrimination. Now, this unquestionably was a positive step, but um, it did nothing to address the, um, the burden that transgender people had of trying to achieve gender recognition in the first place. So then, um, in 2013, the UK passed the, um, the Marriage Same-Sex Couples Act. So this finally joined other countries in legalizing marriage between gay and lesbian couples. So another, obviously the LGBT community is very happy to see this step, but um, there were serious concerns remaining about how it applied to couples where either spouse was transgender. That is, the wording was such that it granted the cisgender spouse the power to instantly annul an otherwise happy marriage if they disapproved of their partner's gender identity. And this is sometimes referred to as the spousal veto. So then, um, in 2016, you see we're getting there, hang with me, the UK's Women and Equalities Committee published a comprehensive review of the Gender Recognition Act, and it basically just went through enumerating its many deficiencies, as well as some related ones in the Equality Act, and recommending that the whole thing be reviewed and revamped. Now, the following year, uh, the Scottish government published its own review of the GRA, and um, in it, it noted that the GRA placed intrusive and onerous requirements on those applying for gender recognition and proposed that it be reformed to bring it in line with international best practice. So yeah, finally, um, in 2018, the Government Equality Office of the UK finally agreed to conduct a widespread consultation into potential reforms to the GRA. And that ran from July to October of that year and elicited feedback from well over 100,000 people, plus hundreds and hundreds of charities and um, other organizations, the vast majority of which were broadly in favor of simplifying the process by which trans people could amend their legal gender status. Now, such reforms, had they been implemented, might have brought the UK more in line with other nations that actually permit trans adults to self-declare their gender without, you know, having to undergo, oh, sterilization or other medical procedures. Um, this is the case in like Argentina, Colombia, Denmark, Ireland, and of course Malta. So yeah, it could have been the case the UK could have moved up the rainbow list by taking a very positive step for transgender people. Predictably, however, uh, that consultation brought the bigots right out of the woodwork. So various single-issue anti-trans groups mobilized all of their members to oppose any progressive changes to the GRA, and in fact to deliberately spread misinformation about the purpose and the implications of any such reforms. So yeah, these transphobic organizations um, have access to significant sources of funding to bankroll their hate campaigns, not to mention documented links to the American far right and religious fundamentalist groups and publications, which have repeatedly shown zero interest in protecting women's rights, but every interest in controlling women's bodies and policing their lives. So yeah, these, um, these British anti-trans groups, which style themselves as feminist while abandoning every single tenet of feminism, are um, in technical terms what we would call useful idiots for regressive right-wing ideologies that seek to entrench the patriarchy and to relegate women to subordinate societal roles. So the turf, I'm sorry, the gender critical denizens of Mumsnet seem perfectly oblivious uh, that their hateful rhetoric and actions end up harming all women. And let's not forget trans men as well. So though I could go further and actually point out that um, greater intolerance uh, weakens society as a whole. So it's not just trans men and trans women, it's everyone who gets to suffer in the end. You know, yay. Which unfortunately is precisely what we've seen here in the UK over the past couple of years, where there's been this marked uptick in, well, the demonization of trans people in the tabloid and let's face it, mainstream press. The 
seemingly endless deluge of factually inaccurate articles has succeeded in stoking mistrust and fear um, of an already marginalized group that has done absolutely nothing to deserve it because the UK media is um, it's clearly more interested in generating clicks and ad revenue than it is in engaging in anything resembling, oh, I don't know, journalism. Uh, it chooses not to present the overwhelming body of evidence that indicates that transgender people are not a threat to anyone. All the while, the, um, the UK government has sat on the results of the GRA consultation, you know, distracted no doubt by its obsession with sabotaging the future of Britain by severing our existing relationships with Europe and plunging the British economy into a free fall. Uh, in fact, it dragged its heels so very long on releasing the results or discussing possible reforms in the wake of the consultation that the Scottish government finally carried out its own public consultation, which ran from December of last year through to March of this one. And then, in an exciting plot twist, back at the end of April, and in the midst of this growing COVID-19 crisis, everything took a sudden turn for the even worse. Liz Truss, you know, Minister for Women and Equalities, revealed she would propose specific changes to the GRA by the summer, but she couched her announcement in the form of very familiar dog whistles to UK transphobes. For instance, she opined that people under 18 should be protected from making irreversible decisions, which in the context implies irreversible medical procedures for trans youth. Now, this is a popular and utterly baseless talking point of transphobes the world over. The fact of the matter is the NHS does not offer any irreversible transgender treatments and certainly no gender confirming surgeries for anyone under the age of 18. I mean, it never has, and no one has ever argued that it should. This is a complete fiction, or to put it more bluntly, an outright fucking lie that is presented by anti-trans campaigners on Mumsnet and other hives of scum and villainy in hopes of alarming uninformed parents. And by the way, these are the kind of truly shitty human beings that, um, that J.K. Rowling has decided to ally herself with. You know, ones that gleefully prey on parental fears in order to incite persecution and violence towards a vulnerable and innocent group, those fine folks. <sighs> Similarly, Liz Trust this claimed that um, single-sex spaces require protection. The clear implication here being from trans people, despite the fact that we already have laws in place for assault. So it doesn't matter whether it's in a public toilet or anywhere else, we don't need extra legislation to make the current laws apply to trans people. So her comments can only be interpreted as her signaling that she would seek to deny transgender people access to public toilets and changing rooms and swimming pools and domestic violence refuges and, and every other single sex space imaginable that correspond to their lived gender. Instead, we would be forced to use single sex spaces corresponding to the sex we were assigned at birth, regardless of the amount of physical danger and verbal abuse that doing so would subject us to. Have I mentioned that the Tories are heartless fucking cretins? Oh good, I'm just checking. So yeah, whilst Britain's transphobic bigots uh, rejoiced at these implied promises by the Minister for Women and Equalities to impose further misery and discrimination on the trans population, the rest of the public went into high alert. LGBT folk are well aware that an attack upon any part of our community is merely testing the waters for an attack upon the rest of us later. So we and our straight allies leapt into motion to present Liz Trust with ample evidence debunking the many lies, half-truths, and deliberate misunderstandings that a tiny minority of anti-trans groups have spread via the tabloid press. Unfortunately, it would seem that Liz Trust, like so many of her conservative colleagues, um, is not at all interested in scientific evidence or truth or harm reduction because if any of these things actually mattered to her, she would have amended her plans. But she hasn't. In point of fact, she's doubled down on her original position as the Sunday Times piece clearly signposts her intention to shelve the much needed reforms to the 16-year-old Gender Recognition Act in favor of rolling back transgender rights during the middle of a pandemic and global economic collapse because priorities. Which brings us back to Wednesday's Parliament session. 
When it was finally her turn to speak, Liz Truss studiously avoided any discussion of trans rights, gender self-declaration, or medical provisions for trans youth. Instead, she claimed the conservatives wanted to stop gay conversion therapy, even though it's not actually practiced here in Britain, and since every single professional body on the planet has long declared it to be unethical, unscientific nonsense, it's not like it was poised to gain a sudden foothold here either. In short, the Tories are pretending to tackle a problem that doesn't exist, whilst plotting to do far worse things to transgender people behind the scenes. They must think we're awfully gullible. Anyone who's witnessed this government in action knows that they haven't changed their mind on this. Instead, what's likely caused Liz Truss to have second thoughts about revealing her plans on Wednesday was the incredible swell of public indignation that arose in response to the Sunday Times article. In the day running up to her parliament spot, over 25,000 people wrote into the Prime Minister's office to denounce her intentions as hashtag not in my name. And a further 8,000 or so wrote to Liz Trust directly. Now the Tories have always been cowards and sensing which way the wind was blowing, it's not too surprising she decided to postpone any further revelations regarding her trans exclusionary policies. For now. Sadly, it doesn't matter whether she waits a week or a month or till the middle of the autumn. Whenever she finally decides the UK public is distracted and or confused enough to come clean with her plans, it's going to be a total shit show for LGBT rights. Here's why. See all those little blue dots? They represent seats occupied by members of the Conservative Party. Now, do you see how all the other political parties combined only have mm, three quarters as many seats as the Tories? That means that whatever laws the Tories desperately want to pass will get passed, however pernicious or destructive they may be, and however poorly they represent the will of the people. This graphic, sort of in and of itself, is a good illustration of a non-functional democracy, but again, I'll save that for the next video. Despite the fact that 70% of the 108,000 respondents to the 2018 GRA consultation told the government in no uncertain terms that they don't consider trans people to be any sort of threat and would prefer that the process of legal gender recognition be simplified for them, the Conservatives are doing the exact same thing they do every time they receive evidence that contradicts their current approach. First, they ignore it. Second, they claim they weren't aware of it. And then third, they desperately try to discredit it. It's the pattern they followed when pushing through Brexit. It's the pattern they followed for responding to COVID-19. And what a shock, it's the pattern they're using for dismantling trans rights. They've actually had the cheek to suggest that the GRA consultation results were skewed by an avalanche of responders generated by trans rights groups. Wow, let's, um, let's unpack that, shall we? Trans and non-binary people comprise maybe 1% of the British population. We are a marginalized group and the entire UK media has spent the last few years painting a huge target on our backs. Also, unlike many hate groups aligned against us, whose members have been shown again to be connected to the well-funded religious right in America, LGBT charities and rights groups often operate on shoestring budgets. We don't have the resources to skew a nationwide consultation in our favor. We barely have the resources to counter and debunk the unending barrage of lies spewed about us in the press. But if common sense isn't enough to sway you, then there's an even stronger argument in support of why the GRA consultation results are almost certainly valid. Long-running studies, uh, like the British Social Attitudes Survey, which has tracked UK attitudes towards sexual relationships, amongst other things, since 1983, show an ever-increasing support for the LGBT community. In fact, the most recent BSA data finds that wholly 83% of the British public state that they aren't prejudiced at all towards trans people. And furthermore, that 49% responded to say that they feel any sort of prejudice or discrimination towards trans people is always wrong. By contrast, only 6% of those who responded stated that being prejudiced against trans people was rarely or never wrong. 
So let that sink in, assuming, as we do, that both trans-inclusive and anti-trans organizations encourage members of the public to respond to the GRA consultation back in 2018, then out of every 100 random members of the public who were motivated by these arguments to take part, at least 49 of them would have responded in favor of trans rights, whilst at most maybe six or seven of them would have argued against them. Therefore, a trans-positive response rate of 70% is far from an unexpected or anomalous result on the 2018 GRA consultation, especially seeing as the UK public has already demonstrated repeatedly over the course of four decades its growing acceptance of trans people and its growing distaste for anti-trans prejudice. The government knows this, and it's deliberately arguing in bad faith when it pretends that the results aren't representative of the UK population. Recall as well that um, they've been sitting on these results for two years now because they weren't the ones they wanted to hear. So, should all of us who long you know, to achieve a just, tolerant society simply pack it in in the face of the chokehold the Conservatives currently have over UK law? Hell no. We in the LGBT community are fighting for our rights in every way we possibly can. And we're not going to roll over just because the Tories need another convenient scapegoat to deflect public anger onto. However, the situation is still serious. And we won't be able to stop the UK from gradually going the way of other regressive European countries like Poland, Romania, Hungary, Bulgaria, and Russia. Remember the horror stories there without the steadfast support of our straight allies. So, what can you do to help? Well, obviously you have to take a stand for LGBT folk right now. I mean, merely not being a bigot isn't sufficient, um, which by the way, applies equally well to the Black Lives Matter movement. I mean, a passive lack of prejudice is not the same thing as allyship. To be an ally, you need to actively support marginalized groups and spread awareness of the threats that they are facing. Now, I know not everyone will be in a position to safely call out bigoted, uninformed opinions by family, friends, or coworkers. However, those of you who have greater societal privilege, for instance, white skin, job security, or let's be honest, just being male, really need to step up and yes, it's uncomfortable, and yes, you'll feel exposed, but just imagine how much more exposed, how much more uncomfortable, how much more literally endangered LGBT people feel every single day in a world that's constantly being cited by the mainstream media and our so-called leaders to hate and persecute us. So, if you're willing to help, let me supply a few arguments that you can use whenever someone raises the trans issue. First off, uh, the stance of the medical profession is that trans people are scientifically valid. And yes, it's incredibly depressing that anyone still thinks this is up for debate, but sadly people do. As is true for the 10% um, the of the human race that it falls somewhere in the LGBT spectrum, being transgender represents a perfectly normal variance in our species, similar to variations in height, bone structure, muscle mass, eye color, skin tone, etc., etc., etc. As for the psychiatric profession, they've strongly affirmed in recent years that gender dysphoria is not a mental illness and that trans people are not suffering from a mental disorder. Likewise, social workers have documented the fact that the primary reason that trans people experience higher rates of clinical depression, substance abuse, and suicide is due to being systematically discriminated against and excluded from full participation in society, a situation that the changes Liz Truss is proposing would greatly exacerbate, by the way, just saying. And as for police records, um, they clearly show that trans people are far more likely to be the victims of crime than the perpetrators of it. Despite the handful of tired, cherry-picked examples that trans folks love to trot out, the simple truth of the matter is that the percentage of transgender people who are sexual abusers is far smaller than the percentage of cisgender or straight people who are sexual abusers. 
oh, and uh, transgender people are per capita far more likely to be sexually abused or forced into sex work than cisgender people. So there's that. Also, um, criminalizing trans people for using public toilets appropriate to their gender will only make the government directly complicit in furthering our discrimination. I mean, forcing trans women to use the men's loo, or forcing trans men to use the women's, or forcing non-binary or non-gender conforming people to use either will increasingly result in, well, let's face it, physical and verbal assault. This is because that 6% of the UK population who feel prejudice against trans people is rarely or never wrong will feel emboldened to take matters into their own hands. Not to mention that any cisgender woman whose appearance just isn't deemed sufficiently feminine by these bigots will suffer the exact same questioning and obviously abuse. So I've shown you that these sorts of you know, bathroom bills that we've heard going ahead in the States, and fortunately in some districts been um, having been repealed, harm the very people that they claim to protect. Liz Truss knows this, this government knows this, and they just don't care. Um, the Conservative Party has always stood for the patriarchy, and will be perfectly happy to see women's lives more closely monitored and constrained as an accidental consequence of the legislation that they are hoping to push through. So we need you to help us fight this, if only to protect the freedoms of the people that you personally love and hold dear. I mean, the media and the government has demonstrated it does not have our best interests at heart, and it obviously wants to keep us divided and intolerant, which is a situation that harms all of us. So remember, the great majority of people in Britain actually do support trans rights, and many of those who don't are only mistrustful of us because they've been fed a steady diet of lies and hatred by a tiny sliver of bigots who actively despise us. Hopefully you can see that anti-trans groups aren't even remotely feminist, as all of their talking points and most of their priorities seem to align perfectly with the patriarchy. I mean, consider for a minute. Transphobes argue for fixed sex determinism. Um, they believe women are defined by our genitals. Uh, they think women are inherently weaker and therefore must be protected by men, along with all of the icky kind of property connotations that that implies. And they feel extremely threatened by anyone who does not conform to expected societal gender roles. So, oh yeah, and actually one more thing. Um, instead of striving for equity for everyone, especially those in marginalized groups, which by the way is a principal tenet of feminism, the gender critical crowd consistently sows division and discrimination solely on the basis of their irrational fear of and disgust for 1% of the human population. People, these are not feminists, they're just sad, pathetic hate mongers. And if you see one coming, you should probably run a mile. In my personal experience, most folks who actually meet a trans person and who possess even a modicum of basic human empathy immediately realize that we're no threat to anyone, certainly not to society as a whole, and we just want to live our lives in peace, you know, like everyone else. So please help us do that. I mean, when you're chatting with family and friends or colleagues, if the opportunity arises, maybe, you know, mention that you're a bit worried for trans folk right now, and then use that as a springboard to discuss the wider implications of societal intolerance towards any marginalized or vulnerable group. The conversation might get awkward for a few minutes or hours, but you'll survive and you'll be able to stand up tall and say you've actually been an ally. Anyway, Thank you if you do choose to take action during this tumultuous moment in human civilization, whether you speak out for trans rights or for queer folk in general, or for people of color, or for the disabled, or for the homeless. The main thing is an awkward conversation is a small price to pay for making the world a better place. So let's have more awkward conversations, okay? Okay. <laughs> Anyway, I'll be back soon uh, with that democracy video. In the meantime, stay safe. Well, wasn't that fun? If you agree, there's a few things you can do, like click the like button or leave me some feedback as a comment or subscribe if you're not already subscribed to my channel. All of these things help.
And if you'd like to move beyond that and support the channel and the videos I do in a more substantive fashion, I've listed a number of sort of donation options here on this final slide. Right, I think that's about it, and I'll look forward to seeing you all in future videos. Take care.